This lecture series has been started for uh, many years ago um, by Lori Mann, who is um, a very good friend of, of Dr. Hecker. And um, in honor of Lori, who passed away last year, uh, we have uh, worked with the Historical Society to continue this series of lectures with Dr. Hecker. And uh, in his honor and, and, and in uh, uh, Lori's honor, as well as uh, his wife, Alice. Uh, the lecture series uh, will be renamed the uh, Alice and Lori Mann Lecture Series. <laughs> to, honor that, uh, to honor that partnership. Um, we'd like to uh, invite uh, Alice Mann, if you're here, to come on up. I would like to present her with these flowers. And thank you very much. heaven God we're grateful for this earth and this abundance and we're grateful for this place on the hill that we live and work and have come to know and we're grateful father for our speaker this evening that we may and ask that we may have thy providence on us that we will hear understand and that he in his presentation will be able to present material that we have come to speak. And these things we say in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, John Rumner from the Historical Society. Um, he will be introducing Dr. Hecker. And so, uh, Mr. Rumner. Thank you, and uh, we're certainly pleased to be co-sponsors on this yearly lecture, which is obviously so, so popular with the community. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to make a few comments uh, about Lori Mann, who, who really championed these talks for about the last five years. And Lori was like many of you here in the audience. You know, he, he put in his 30 years at the lab, then he retired. And for the rest of his life, he did volunteer work and, and uh, community service. And um, I just want to give a couple of examples that were really special to me. Uh, after he retired, Lori uh, ran for uh, county council, served 10 years. Seven of those 10 years, he was either the vice chair or the chair of the county council. So he was really in a position to make things happen in this community, and he certainly did. Uh, Laurie was uh, chairman at the time of the Sarah Brandy fire. He, uh, so he was right in the middle of all the decisions that had to be made, the logistics, the evacuation, all the relations with the neighboring communities. And, and then when the fire was over, he went to Washington, testified before Congress for financial help for the recovery of the community very successfully. <clears throat> but I, I think of all of the accomplishments that Lori attained while he was on the county council, the one that was closest to him and to Alice was uh, his efforts to begin the sister city program with Sarov, Russia. Um, and you know, that really became a passion for, for both of them. Uh, Laurie made eight trips out to uh, Sarov as part of the program. We exchanged hundreds of our citizens in you know, both directions, you know, doctors, teachers, <coughs> librarians, you know, business people, you know, and of course, administrators, county administrators. I think the part that Laurie especially was proud of was uh, the, the student exchanges at the high school level. You know, one year they'd send a group there and then they'd send a, a group here. And uh, Laurie was always, it was very, uh, 
determined to include some of the uh, students from the local pueblos, just to, so that uh, you could broaden the cultural experience of all these of all these kids. And uh, that program went on for you know 15 to 18 years, and possibly we'll get some insight from Sig uh, what's in the future there. But we hope. Uh, in 2009, the community named uh, Lori and Alice Mann as uh, living treasures of the community. And on behalf of the Historical Society, Alice, I won't make you get up out of your chair again, but uh, we would like to present to you our history medallion. It's a very nice bronze medallion. And we are presenting this to you, Alice, in appreciation for all that you and Laurie did to make this uh, community a better place to live. Thank you very much. Okay, now our speaker. Well, you know, SIG really does not, in this community, SIG does not need an introduction. Um, I think it's safe to say that our speaker tonight is the uh, foremost authority on nuclear weapons issues, especially international issues in the whole world. You know? So we're very fortunate to have him. Um, I think there's very good evidence to back that statement up, and I'd like to give you part of that evidence. <laughs> Well, you know, to start with, Sig was the director of Los Alamos National Laboratory for over 10 years. There is still a bit of magic to the words Los Alamos and, and a name recognition all over the world. So, you know, that was his foot in the door. Combine that with his science credentials and his remarkable speaking ability, he received invitations to visit companies, countries all over the world. Almost 50 trips to Russia, six trips to North Korea, several visits to China, India, Pakistan, and the Middle East. And these weren't just visits to the, to the embassies. He was, he was invited into the inner sanctum of the nuclear facilities of these countries and, and was able to talk to some of the very top scientists of those countries uh, because of his credibility and reputation. The, um, the many trips to Russia were mostly linked to the initiative that uh, Dr. Hecker and Dr. Uh, Radi Okayev, his counterpart at Arzmas 16, uh, in about 1990, and they recognized that there were some very serious security and safety issues relating to uh, nuclear weapons, uh, the transportation, storage, dismantlement, especially in the uh, republics. And uh, so they arranged for engineers and scientists from the nuclear weapons labs in this country to get together with their counterparts in, in Russia. It was a memorable time, 20 years of remarkable good relations between our two countries. And as you probably know, I mean, Sig has documented this really, really well in his two-volume book, Doomed to Cooperate, uh, published by the uh, Historical Society. And by the way, uh, SIG has donated 100% of the proceedings of the sales of this book to the Historical Society. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our country has recognized uh, SIG's contributions, especially in the areas of science. He uh, received the Enrico Fermi Award 
presented by President uh, Obama in 2009. When he received that award, he joined uh, a company of Robert Oppenheimer, Norris Bradbury, and Harold Agnew. So, good company. We're really proud of you, SIG. Uh, American Nuclear Society's Seaboard Award, Department of Energy's EO Lawrence Award, and the Laboratory Medal. Uh, he's a member of many national uh, academies, including uh, the Russian Academy of Science, Sciences and uh, the India Institute of Metals. So he's, he's recognized everywhere. Um, many of you in this room, though, you know, he's, we're very impressed with all these credentials. But many of you just know uh, Sig and Nina as friends, you know, from, from growing up in this community. They raised their four daughters. They're all hilltoppers here. Uh, both Sig and Nina have been uh, very active in the community. Sig was president of the ski club. Nina, uh, very active in the, in the garden club. And uh, although Sig is now uh, affiliated with the uh, Stanford University and they spend a good portion of the year at Palo Alto, they continue to come back here frequently, keep their ties with this community. And, uh, and this lecture series is one example of how they keep their ties. So with that, I would uh, like you to uh, join me in welcoming our friend and our speaker, Dr. Uh, Sid Hecker. Let me make sure and test that I'm on. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. <clears throat> okay, if I start to fade out, then uh, please raise your hand. So thank you, John, for your very kind introduction, and particularly uh, for the recognition uh, of Alice and, and Laurie Mann, because uh, Laurie is the one uh, who did convince me every year, I think it's at least uh, the last eight years, to come and give a lecture uh, here, and I've done that, and it's always been such a pleasure to do so. Uh, and as you probably uh, and properly recognize that what Laurie has done for this community, he truly was a, a man for the people. I mean, that's what he did all his life. That's what he did here. I don't think I've known a, a more community conscious person uh, than Laurie Mann. And of course, he was always there with Alice Mann. And so it's so nice to be able to recognize uh, Laurie. And I'm sure that's one of the reasons for this enormous turnout today. I keep telling Nina maybe the other reason is I'm not sure what else there is to do in Los Alamos <laughs> on a Saturday night. And then particularly when you're not tired out from skiing during the day because Unfortunately, there is no snow. Uh, and so, I'm, I'm, quite frankly, I'm deeply humbled uh, by this enormous turnout. And I saw my most favorite members of the audience. I just saw a trickle in here a minute or two ago, and there were three little ones, <laughs> three future Stanford students. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so. What, uh, what I thought I would do is, um, is give you an update on North Korea. I talked about North Korea uh, last year. Uh, I'm not sure it depends on, on how much time I, I wind up having. Uh, if I have the chance, I'll just give you a quick sort of tour through the rest of the nuclear world because as John had indicated, uh, I spend a lot of time sort of in all of the nuclear places uh, of the world. So let me take you through. So what, what I showed last year, uh, as you go back and you look at the nuclear challenge, and I look back at our last three presidents before Trump, they all faced the North Korea nuclear challenge. President Clinton's challenge is don't let him build a bomb. It turns out he succeeded. President George W. Bush's challenge was don't let him build a bomb. He failed. President Obama's challenge was 
don't let him get from the bomb to a nuclear arsenal. And he failed. And so this is actually one of the things where President Trump came into office and it wasn't his fault. <laughs> it wasn't his fault. And so his job, as far as I'm concerned, was don't let him use the bomb. You know, how can we avoid using the bomb now that they actually have a nuclear arsenal? You know, unfortunately, the war of words that I'll explain some has prevented the needed dialogue so that the bomb isn't used. And so that's what I'm going to go through, 2017, as to what's happened and then what the prospects are. So this is how I started last year's lecture, uh, because Kim Jong-un, in last year, 2017, in his New Year's address, uh, said that um, he's getting ready and they're very close to launching an intercontinental ballistic missile. Okay, President Bush, it was President-elect Bush at the time, on January 2nd, he already gave us the idea that he's going to use Twitter because he tweeted and said, it won't happen. It won't happen. So what did happen in 2017? Well, these two guys brought the world to hair trigger uh, in the nuclear business. So how did it happen? Well, it, it turns out North Korea made its march towards this ICBM. Uh, and here it was uh, in April, they paraded one of the big missiles. Uh, and then in May, they went ahead and launched a missile this is what's called an intermediate range ballistic missile with a range of about 4,000 kilometers, which turns out is just enough to reach Guam. So that pretty much uh, got President uh, Trump's attention. But then it turns out Kim Jong-un also threatened. He said, we're going to be able to launch from anywhere at any time. This is one of the places he was able to launch from, submarine launch. This one, he not only launched, but actually shot off four missiles at once, you know, into the Sea of Japan. Now, this was in March time frame already. And then in July, it turns out twice, he actually demonstrated, and by the way, when I say he demonstrated, at these launches, He's there at every one of them, or at least the ones that succeed. The ones that fail, we don't, we don't know so much about. But the ones that succeed, he's there, right in front. And then, of course, he's there to celebrate. So it turns out, in July, uh, first uh, on the 4th of July, then the 28th, uh, they actually launched missiles that are capable of being ICBMs. As I'll tell you later, uh, they launched them, however, instead of the trajectory to reach the United States. They launched them in a very high, what's called a lofted trajectory, for a whole bunch of, of reasons. But the performance was such that if they would straighten those out, they could reach the United States. And, and these were the so-called uh, Hwasong uh, 14s. Then in November, they launched this Hwasong-15, and this is one monster uh, of a missile. It is really huge. A and this was the best performance yet uh, by a North Korean uh, missile. And, and by the way, when I say he's always there, he's standing here, for example, uh, at, in front of the missile which was brought in uh, on the road uh, on this uh, TEL, as they're called. Uh, and so this one also was lofted very, very high. It flew for 53 minutes or so. Uh, and the missile people will tell you, if you take the performance of this missile and you launch it on a standard trajectory, it could go out to 13,000 kilometers, which is enough to reach all of the United States. So this thing is an ICBM if they would straighten it out. So he was able to achieve that. And in fact, if you look at the missile capabilities, which they've really developed intensely since about 2013, 
Although, as I'll tell you much later on, this has been an ongoing process. It didn't just come on, uh, to be in 2013. But uh, the point of this slide, which I don't expect you to read at all, but it's just to get the point across, they essentially have the entire gamut uh, of missiles now, from short-range missiles, medium-range, they would be enough to reach South Korea and Japan, to intermediate range, they could reach Guam, and then to ICBM range, they could reach the United States. So they have that capability. So what about the weapons? Well, it, it turns out, you, you know, they don't typically show you weapons. I mean, most countries don't show you the devices. But lo and behold, in 2016, Kim Jong-un is not only there with the missiles, he's there with this thing that some people have dubbed the disco ball. So this round thing, they said, was one of their miniaturized uh, nuclear warheads. Uh, and it's clever enough that they actually show the missile that would carry it uh, and it would fit uh, into that missile. Okay, so now we try to figure out, I mean, because as I'll tell you in a minute, I mean, that's the real trick uh, of making a nuclear warhead. You want to make it small enough to fit into a missile and then be able to survive the sequence of launch, flight, and re-entry. So the question was, well, how, how big is this? Well, if you look carefully and you make an approximation as to how wide around Kim Chung-un is, <laughs> then you say, okay, well, this is about 60 centimeters, you know, 24 <laughs> inches or so, a couple of feet. So this is small. You know, it's a bit peculiar looking, but they said, you know, they tested such a miniaturized device. And then in September of this year, Actually, this is quite remarkable. You know, people say that North Korea is the most secretive nation of any in the world. Well, just from what I've shown you here, they, they post this. You know, we don't get this through our intel agents. They post it. They post the missile launches, all of that stuff. They give you videos of the missile launches. It's all, it's all out there. So this one, lo and behold, Two hours before the nuclear test, in September, they released uh, these photos. And so they said, this is their modern hydrogen bomb. Modern hydrogen bomb. And if you look again there with Kim Jong-un, it's being explained to him and he's trying to figure out, so what is this thing? And, and here's a person that I will, excuse me. A person that I will come back to, and that's the, uh, the director of the Yongbyon Nuclear Center. And John, I was actually there seven times uh, in, in North Korea, and I visited with him four times. Uh, and so he's explaining uh, this thing, which more or less, as far as one can say in the unclassified world, it sort of has the general characteristics of a modern hydrogen bomb or a two-stage thermonuclear uh, device, so a hydrogen bomb. So they show us this. So trying to then figure out, so what do they really have? Well, we know very little except what they showed us. And then the other clue that we have is that they have tested these devices. Uh, they've tested them underground. And for the most part, by the way, I know a number of you worked out at Nevada test site. And the trick is always, how do you make sure you contain those nuclear explosions underground? They've done six and they've contained them all. Uh, there are a couple of them that leaked some of the noble uh, gases, uh, but that's not terribly uh, unusual and also not dangerous. So as we look at those six tests that they've done, the first one now back in 2006, and then the last one, or the most recent, September uh, of 2017, we sort of walked through. The first one didn't work so well. But again, as the Los Alamos folks know, your failures teach you more than your successes. So they learned a lot. Uh, the second one in 2009, you know, it was reasonably small uh, yield, so two to seven kilotons. But as far as I was concerned, that worked. Uh, and then the others all worked. And in fact, the one in September 3rd, you know, we, we don't know whether they actually tested this thing that they showed us. However, this test was a big test. 
And so whereas the other ones, they have gotten to up to about from 7 to 25 kilotons. And just to give you an idea of what that means, so Hiroshima, the, the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima, that was about 13 or so kilotons. So one bomb, one plane, one city destroyed. So as far as I'm concerned, that was good enough, 13 kilotons. Uh, Nagasaki, which was a plutonium bomb, unlike Hiroshima, which was a uranium bomb, uh, that was about 20, 21 kilotons. This thing here that they shot was about 10 times uh, the explosive power. So in most likelihood, although we don't know for sure, uh, that most likely was a hydrogen bomb or a two-stage thermonuclear device. We don't know whether it was the one that they showed, because the reason they showed that one is they wanted us to think they have one small enough, because that one would be small enough to be able to put in their ICBM. We don't know that for sure. Uh, at first it was thought to be just larger than 100 kilotons, but the more people have refined that, it's closer to 250 kilotons. So that is one big bomb. If it is of that particular design and size and weight, uh, you know, that would be a very destructive bomb. So what you have to say now, you know, they've done these six tests over a 10-year time period, 11-year time period. They have learned a lot from that process. So they know how to make bombs. So then let's so, sort of put all of that together and say, well, what capabilities do they have today? Uh, I like to show this one and just update it as time goes on. So if you're going to have a nuclear arsenal, you've got to have three things. You've you got to have the bomb fuel. That means plutonium highly, or highly enriched uranium. And if you're going to have a hydrogen bomb, you've got to have the isotopes of hydrogen, namely deuterium tritium. So you've got to have bomb fuel. Uh, and then you have to be able to weaponize. That means the design, machine, put together, and so forth, and test. Uh, and then third, you have to deliver it. So plutonium, uh, we have a pretty good assessment uh, because you have to make plutonium in a reactor. Uh, and we know a lot about that reactor. Howard Menlove knows a real lot about that reactor. I'm sorry, I keep knocking this off. Highly enriched uranium, uh, and, and by the way, one of the reasons we know, we know a lot about their reactor. The second reason we know, they let people like me in. I've been all over their reactor, their reprocessing facility, all of those places. I've talked to their people about plutonium metallurgy. Uh, and when I did this first in 2004, I came back and I said, these guys can build the bomb. And they did, and then they tested in 2006. Highly enriched uranium, uh, they had said for years that they don't do enriched uranium. I used to go there and I said, I know you do enriched uranium. They said, oh, no, you don't understand this country, Dr. Hecker. Well, in 2010, that's actually the last time uh, that they invited me back in, uh, they showed me a modern centrifuge plant. And so they can do highly enriched uranium. However, unlike reactors, which we can watch from overhead to see whether they're operating, uh, uranium enrichment plants, you can put them in a building, in a basement, in a tunnel, we just don't know. And so the message that time, you know, when they had me in was, hey, look, we've got highly enriched uranium and you'll never know how much we have. And it turns out we don't know how much they have. So the best we can do is I make this estimate. And I put the estimate on a whole bunch of analysis, including my visit particularly. Uh, and, but it's still an estimate. Nuclear tests, we know they've done six. So how, how many bombs do they have? Again, we don't know that for sure, but they have enough material, I believe, sort of on the upper end for 25 to 30 bombs. So that's an arsenal. That's a lot. And then, as we said, they now have made significant progress with their missiles. So then the question, of course, is can they put these nuclear warheads inside the missiles and, and can they survive? So what I meant before, uh, again, if you can see this, this is sort of height or the, uh, uh, the uh, altitude. Uh, and here's the range. And these missiles, the ICBMs, they did in these lofted trajectories. 
I think one reason for that is to keep them close to where they can actually monitor things uh, on that missile. If they would straighten them out, then they would have this ICBM capability. But can they indeed house one of those war nuclear warheads? So we actually don't know whether they tested the devices that they showed us. The ones they showed us would be small enough. So the key with the warheads is they have to be small enough, they have to be light enough, and then they have to be robust enough that they can actually survive the launch. You know, that's a lot of stress, a lot of vibrations. Then the cold flight in space, and then particularly the fiery re-entry. Uh, into the atmosphere. That's tough to do. And as far as I'm concerned, you had to do some of those real rocket tests with re-entry to be able to get there. So at, at, again, we don't know for sure, but at this point, my best judgment is that I think they can reach all of South Korea and Japan with a nuclear tip missile, with one of those that's Hiroshima Nagasaki size. Now actually at that point, once they got to, to that point, you know, I've been working a lot with my government, so trying to advise them as well as possible, I said, that's enough, you know, that's the crisis, that's what we have to avoid. But then particularly with President Trump's tweet, but not only President Trump, it's really the American public. American public doesn't like to think it's vulnerable you know, to an attack from a North Korea nuclear weapon. We've got folks out on the West Coast, the people around Stanford who are worried about getting nuked you know, by Kim Jong-un. I would say I don't lose any sleep o over that part, uh, but if they can reach all of South Korea and Japan, uh, that already is very serious. So I think work still needs to be done for them to put one of those warheads on an intercontinental ballistic missile and be able to survive. They still have, they need a number of missile tests. You don't just do one lofted test and say you have, you know, uh, missiles ready to go. And besides, unless you've done all the measurements as to what's going to happen inside, you know, the re-entry vehicle, uh, you can't possibly think that you can actually do all of that survival. Uh, and so my view then is they still need to do a number of tests and need some time. People in Washington have pressed me very hard and said, okay, how long? And I said, I don't want to answer that. You know, I don't know. It depends how many tests they do. They said, how long? So I said, okay, if they do, you know, five or six missile tests, do another nuclear test, two years or so. But it's a guess. You know, I don't know that for sure. Okay, so now we take all of that that I just showed you. This is sort of the what they have. And we now put it in the political arena. So in September, September 19th, President Trump goes to the General Assembly of the United Nations and he says we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission. Now for any of those of you who know anything about Korea, in fact in most of the Asian countries, the pride in you know, on the sensitivities, you know, to call him a little Rocket Man, you know, that uh, certainly would get his attention. It was all there. For those who can see this, <laughs> there were a number of people like me, you know, who just said, oh my God, I can't, I watched it. You know, I said, I can't believe he said that. Well, it turns out I wasn't the only one because this guy is General John Kelly, who is his chief of staff. And this is a real photo of the time that he made that statement. So I think he was also a little bit concerned. And then the guy on the other side, Kim Jong-un, he came back a few days later and he set the web into motion because he said, I will tame that mentally deranged U.S. dotard with fire. Of course, there's 99% of the U.S. public said, what's a dotard? <laughs> And so the web lit up, people trying to find out what's a dotard. Well, it's sort of a senile old character, you know, is what it is. So he got back. And then things got worse, okay, if you can believe that. So what happened here, and I'll check out Kim Jong-un, I mean, he's really, he's looking good. 
<laughs> and um, this, this is this year's New Year's uh, Eve speech. And actually, I mean, what he said, you know, the entire United States is within range of our nuclear weapons. A nuclear button is always on my desk. This is reality. This is not a threat. Well, Trump was not going to be trumped on this one. And so he tweeted, saying the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un just stated that nuclear button is on his desk at all times. Will someone from his depleted and food-starved regime please inform him that I too have a nuclear button? But it's much bigger and more powerful than his. And my button works. All right, so that's where we were. So what about the button? Well, it turns out there is no nuclear button. <laughs> There's something we call it the nuclear briefcase or the nuclear football. And it's sort of a big attache case that is carried around, follows the president everywhere, and it has the launch codes for the nuclear missiles. And so lo and behold, if you watch very carefully what the North Koreans put on the web, I don't know how well you can see it. It's very difficult to see. Those in the back can't see it at all. But here's Kim Jong-un. Here's the guy. And he's got a briefcase. <laughs> he's got a briefcase. So the message has to be, this is North Korea's nuclear football. So is, is that Kim's nuclear football? Well, if it is, then it turns out Trump was right. He was right. That his button uh, or his suitcase is bigger. <laughs> it's bigger. And this young soldier is carrying, there are two of them, you know, because it's bigger. And here's just another case. Of, so that, that's President Trump's <coughs> nuclear button. But do we really want Kim to demonstrate his nuclear button that it works? That's why I said it really got worse. And then just to throw in a few other things that happened you know, over the course of this past year, I'm sure most of you heard that, that somehow uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, half-brother, Kim Jong-nam, uh, down in Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur uh, was um, essentially attacked uh, with a very sophisticated uh, uh, chemical uh, uh, attack, ke uh, chemical uh, agents. Uh, actually very sophisticated, the so-called VX, and particularly this one is VX2. It's a two-component agent. Uh, one comes across his face, the other one goes the other way. Once the two agents come together, they mix and they kill you. And indeed, he died. Because we don't know for sure exactly what happened, but these kind of agents uh, really only uh, are the properties of states, of very few states, and North Korea is one of those. If it's from North Korea, it's hard to uh, believe that it couldn't have uh, been at least authorized. And then there's this tragic story, uh, which was very important in the United States, this uh, Otto Warm uh, Warmbium, uh, who um, you know, went to North Korea as a tourist, did some things that one probably shouldn't do, but he was arrested, treated brutally. They allowed him to come back, uh, and he died here in the United States. So I show these, you know, just to remind you, I mean, th this is not a very kind regime. Uh, and indeed, Kim Jong-un uh, is indeed brutal. So what do we do now in light of all of this? So. Since I'm at Los Alamos in the nuclear mecca of the world, you know, the Russians used to tell me that. The Indians told me that, you know, the nuclear mecca uh, of the world. <laughs> so what do you do uh, when you have a runaway nuclear reaction or you're worried about a meltdown in a nuclear reactor? You have the fuel rods in there. So what do you do? Of course, Howard Menlove and lots of others know. You <coughs> use control rods. Okay, so you have all that nuclear fuel in there. And then you wind up putting in control rods that sort of suck up the neutrons to get, make sure that reaction sort of goes away. Uh, boron-10, uh, uh, cadmium, for example. 
So my thought was, well, if they use control rods in a nuclear reactor, can we have the equivalent of that? So for example, here, here would be the nuclear fuel. You take these fuel rods and you lower them. So do we have the diplomatic equivalent of control rods? Since we have these two guys on top with this war of words, so how can we you know, tamp things down? And, and it turns out uh, these two uh, gentlemen, Jim Mattis, Secretary of Defense, and Rex Tillerson, Secretary of State, essentially have been acting as those control rods. They keep coming back. I mean, Secretary Mattis, for example, you know, will remind people who are saying uh, that, look, we ought to go in and take them out. He says, if it goes to a military solution, it is going to be tragic on an unbelievable scale. And most of the military leaders will tell you it's going to be worse than anything we've seen since the Second World War. So even though the United States officially says, you know, the military option is on the table, of course it's on the table in case they attack us or if they attack South Korea or Japan. But it's not on the table to go in. And that's what these secretaries tell you. So the question then is, are there control rods in North Korea? I mean, people in this country think these guys are all crazy, you know, starting with Kim Jong-un. It turns out, first of all, he's not crazy. No, he's not crazy. And then in terms of people, uh, since I have had a chance to go there seven times, it turns out you see this guy showing this, you know, peanut-shaped device to Kim Jong-un. He's the same guy sitting here with me this is two weeks after the first North Korean nuclear test. This was in November of 2006. I've had many discussions with him. First of all, he's a fine, fine scientist engineer. He's a very conscientious person. He understands the world. He has real empathy for his country not having enough energy, wants to do something in nuclear energy. But he also heads their nuclear weapons program. This person is actually, this is current foreign minister, Lee Young-ho. Uh, and he gave the response at the United Nations to Trump's speech. And it's fiery. I mean, it really is fiery. However, I also met Lee Young-ho. This guy could be a diplomat any place in the world. He understands the world. He was in the UK, uh, you know, Great Britain, for a number of years as the ambassador. I've had discussions with him about their nuclear program. These guys understand the world. They understand the United States of America. So Kim Jong-un is not surrounded by a bunch of nuts. You know, he actually has people around him who do understand the world. And then what happened, and this is where we are now. So the question is, control rods. What do you use as control rods? Well, it turns out the North and the South themselves lowered the control rods. Uh, and the new president uh, in South Korea, Moon Jae-in, uh, and Kim Jong-un on the North Korean side, uh, they began to look at North Korea attending the Olympics, which will start here in a, in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, and indeed, uh, here is an example of the North Koreans and the South Koreans talking for the first time in a long, long time. Uh, and then actually in terms of fielding a team, that one of the things that was decided that for the women's hockey team, they would actually field a combined team. And there's a lot of objections in South Korea, I'm sure in North Korea also, uh, but indeed that's what they're going to do. And they're going to go to the Olympics. And then there is another part of Kim Jong-un's uh, New Year speech uh, of where he actually said, you know, our republic has at last come to possess powerful and reliable war deterrent which no force and nothing can reverse. And in no way would the United States dare to ignite a war against me or our country. It's very unusual for a North Korean actually to put that in the, in the personal sense. What he meant by this, he said, Already before, we're approaching the completion of our nuclear deterrent. And so that's actually a message he was sending. We're pro approaching the completion. As I said, at, at this particular point, I don't believe they can reach the United States. But if they want to declare victory, that's okay with me. 
And besides, they do actually deter us. They deter us because they can reach all of South Korea and Japan. And by that, they not only destroy our allies, but there's some 200,000 US citizens that live in South Korea. They would kill more American citizens you know, than have died since the Second World War. And that means they can inflict unacceptable damage to the United States. And when that happens, you deter somebody. And by the way, we deter him because that guy is not crazy. He wants to live. So we actually have a situation and have the chance to take advantage with the Olympics, perhaps, being an avenue to at least begin the dialogue. So then what sort of next steps does one take at this point? And again, I, I talk a lot to the folks in the government in as much as possible. And I say, okay, take advantage of this, you know, control rods. Right now the control rods actually appear to be Moon Jae-in, South Korean president, Kim Jong-un, the Olympic Committee, North Korea on the left, uh, on your left, and South Korea on your right. And then, from that point on, I think what we have to be prepared to do is to prepare for this long journey. Uh, what I say first, halt, second, roll back, and then third, eliminate weapons on the Korean Peninsula. Is that possible? I don't know. It's not going to be easy. Okay, I'm going to try something on you now, uh, which is a real eye chart for those of you in the back. You don't have much chance. So this is not ready for prime time, but I thought Los Alamos would be a good audience. And, and what I'm going to try to do with this is to give you an idea as to why it's going to be so hard. And so what I've done here uh, is I show the nuclear timeline as a function uh, of time, starting in 1991 up to 2017. And then as I go across, I say, did the US actually try diplomatic means to engage North Korea? If they did, it's green. If they didn't, it's red. There are three shades of green. For those of you who are 50 shades, I can't do 50 shades of gray. <laughs> I just did three shades of green, three shades of red. So that's what I've got here. Did North Korea try to engage uh, and actually go through with diplomacy? Uh, and then was the diplomacy such that it actually wound up with Americans being on the ground in Yangbyon. That's what YB means. So now, if you really have the diplomatic effort and you have people on the ground, what happens? And then I try to put all the nuclear stuff together in nukes, and again, green is good, red is bad, and then missiles. Okay, red is bad, green is good. What you find from this, first of all, that during the Clinton years, which was up here, there was a lot of green because we had an agreed framework, an agreement with the North Koreans. And we had boots on the ground. And they had played with nuclear weapons already, the option back uh, in uh, the late 80s, early 1990s. So I gave them an R1, a pink. And that's, why, that's what this means, sort of R1, a pink. Uh, and then it went dark green. So actually good, in a good direction. Uh, and then on from there, it turned red because when President Bush came in, George W. Bush, the green turned to red instantly. They tried to kill that agreed framework. Uh, and then in, in the latter half uh, of the Bush administration, they actually started to reach out and, and tried to engage the North Koreans, but never quite got there. And, and the North Koreans were first hanging on, but then they sort of turned away. 2007, 2008, reasonably good, sort of a G2. And then President Obama, bless his heart, he tried to reach out his hand if they unclenched their fist, and they punched him between the eyes with a nuclear test you know, four months after he took over. Uh, and then never really got the diplomacy part back together. And then, of course, with President Trump, uh, it's nothing. That's an R3. So what you see is people who tell you that diplomacy has no chance with North Korea because all they do is cheat. If you actually just study the color flow here, it's just not true. 
things actually worked up here. Now, the missile part, they had missile work going on all of the time. But it was very slow, very, very slow until the past few years when it really ramped up. So there are several lessons that you can learn from this in terms of whether diplomacy had a chance, what it did. Uh, and then uh, I have one more chart that's even busier, uh, which I'm going to try to use to explain why it's so difficult to turn it around, to denuclearize North Korea. You know, what does denuclearize mean? Well, denuclearize means as I mentioned before, you need three things for a bomb. The bomb fuel, you've got to be able to build the bomb and test the bomb, and then you've got to deliver it. Okay, so if I put it together in this sort of chart, where now the only diplomacy piece I have is where there are boots on the ground. So you can see there were boots on the ground, thrown out boots on the ground. Part of this year they had some then uh, thrown out. And then I break it up into plutonium, <coughs> highly enriched uranium, the fusion fuels for hydrogen bombs, tritium, or what's called lithium-6, weaponized missiles, and then I also added on actually import and export to try to study and understand where did they get this stuff or what did they try to sell. And, and again, as you can see from here, we had some green. And while the plutonium turned green, the uranium enrichment, they kept that as a hedge. You know, they continued to sort of slowly build the capabilities for uranium enrichment in case things didn't work out so well. And then when they eventually needed it, it went red. It would have taken significant diplomacy to turn that one around. And then particularly as you get over here, you can see weaponization and missiles. Things have just gone, you know, to full red. By the way, this one, uh, I used five shades instead of three shades each because there are some nuances in there that you can't catch with three shades. So the only point I want to make, actually, with this chart is if, if you're now here in 2017, you go across, forget import-export for the time being, they're still doing some imports, everything is red. Everything is red. The idea of saying that North Korea has to denuclearize that you're going to flip the red to green, you can just see how hopeless that is. And it's 25 years, you know, they've moved in that direction. They have it now, they're just not going to give it up. And so what I mean, you know, the halt, roll back and eventually eliminate, basically what I've been trying to, uh, you know, say in Washington, sort of look at this as saying, this is where we are. And maybe the best we can do is to flip this chart and then systematically go from, gray, from red, a little less red, to pink, maybe a little green, and then eventually the dark green. But this is a long process that takes not only one administration, but it takes a, a real strategy as to how you can turn that around. So that's the idea. All right, so uh, let me take a look at, at the time. I had promised a tour around the nuclear world and so uh, I'm going to do this one pretty quickly. I won't, I won't do any of them justice, but the reason I put this on here, you know, North Korea created the problem because they have pursued the nuclear weapons and then built the weapons, built the arsenal. We created the crisis by the response uh, to the North Korean nuclear program. So we've created that crisis, and because of that crisis, in my opinion, we're not paying enough attention to the parts of the world that really need attention. That, in my opinion, are a much bigger problem than North Korea. Again, North Korea isn't going to attack us. The problem in North Korea is, with the crisis that's created, are we going to stumble into a nuclear war? Misunderstanding, misperceptions. You know, so we have a chance to control that. We're not at this point. Okay, so I was going to walk you through Russia. So one, one good way to actually see what's happening in Russia uh, is, uh, and I know Cheryl Rofer follows this closely, uh, the Valdai meetings. Uh, so these are meetings in Russia uh, that the Russians have, and they, uh, it's sort of like the Davos economic meeting, but they look at sort of the big picture of the world. They uh, invite all these people from all over the world into Russia 
uh, and they talk about the shape of the world and what's going to happen, and then they invite Putin. So in 2014, up here, there's actually something very, very interesting, and again, you can't see it from the back, but it says, the world order, new rules or no rules. Now, if you think about that, and then you think about what Putin and his colleagues did in 2016 with the US election, he was giving us a warning, there's going to be a world with no rules out there. Uh, and actually, what was done, in, in a way, uh, and it's, it's just, it's a great irony. You know, this country, with its technological lead, with its desire for openness in the world, you know, for transparency of everything, with the social media to make sure that everyone is connected to everyone. And what we were going to do is we're going to liberate the entire world by doing that. It's going to be open. Everyone knows what's going on, and everything is going to become democratic. Well, guess what? It didn't happen because the Russians are smart, and particularly Putin and his colleagues are smart, and they turned that whole openness, that whole social media thing, directly against us and used it so incredibly effective to undermine democracies and undermine the liberal order of the world and go in a different direction. And that's what was done during the election. You know, they managed to buy into social media things and just put fake news. That was really fake news. They put this stuff out there. And it was repeated over and over and over. And they were clever enough to be able to put it into those areas that actually made a difference from an election standpoint. Of course, right today, you know, all the focus is on President Trump. Was there collusion? Was there not collusion? That, you know, uh, one would hope that there actually wasn't any collusion on Trump's part. Whether some of his colleagues were terribly naive and, and got taken, you know, by the Russians, that's quite possible. But what's much more important is the fact that these guys have figured how to undermine the very thing that we tried to build. And this liberal order that this country has built since the end of the Second World War. And they're still undermining it. And in his Valdai speech that I show here, uh, it, it is just enormously disturbing. Because Putin actually, again, in fake news, all those things, for example, John, that we did in the book, all the Russian cooperation, Putin has gone in and he's changed the narrative. He's totally changed it. The narrative is the Americans just took advantage of us. You know, through, the, yes, they spent a lot of money, even though he doesn't say that, but he would say, yes, they spent a lot of money. He might admit that. But it was to get into our most secret facilities. They got into every place. They took advantage of us. It turns out that's just baloney. We had them, I had them at Tier 55, our plutonium facility. We had them at our Pentex, you know, which is our weapon assembly plant. No American has ever been inside of their weapons assembly plants. And so they're completely sort of rewriting that narrative. So that's the problem with, with, uh, with Russia. They're also uh, you know, sort of modernizing all of their nuclear forces in, in a major way. And as a result, what you'll actually find, and I'll uh, also mention that with respect to China, the U.S. is actually changing its whole strategy to focus sort of a way of terrorism being the number one to again looking at great power struggles. And if you paid attention in the last couple of days, President Trump's proposed budget for the Defense Department is $716 billion. And so we are again going to spend an enormous amount of money because of Russia, because of China. For Russia and for the people of Russia, who I've got to know, 54 trips uh, to Russia, it's a pity for the people of Russia. Because when he gets reelected this year, by the time he finishes, it'll be 24 years. I think that's going to outdo Stalin even by a year or so. Uh, and instead of harnessing those smart people, incredibly hardworking people, he just driving the country downhill, and it's a pity. Okay, 
Oh, and then of course, you know, our president, you know, the question is, uh, I don't know, I can't say much more than the picture shows. <laughs> okay, Xi Jinping in China. Uh, they had this 19th Party Congress in October. It was a showpiece for Xi Jinping, and sort of for him coming of age as one of the great leaders ever in the history of China. Uh, and he laid out his vision in a three and a half hour speech. He laid out his vision of China, the future of China, uh, and essentially China being a world uh, leader. And uh, again, our President Trump uh, puts uh, a lot uh, of merit on staying on good terms with China, which I think is actually good. But again, this is going to be an enormous challenge for this country. Because whereas Russia doesn't have the capabilities to become a world leading power again, because they simply don't have the economic power, especially the way that they've been run, China has that capability. But China's vision, at least the way that it's laid out, is very different than that vision of the liberal order that the United States has created uh, since the Second World War. And so it's going to be very interesting, very complicated, and we should be paying attention to China. And I don't mean just attention to China from a standpoint of military might, because interestingly enough, the Chinese haven't done that much with their nuclear weapons. You know, they still only have a few hundred nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, we still have uh, many thousands of them left in our arsenal. But they've put more and more of their resources and their importance into economic power. And we need to make sure that we actually keep our own. So it isn't just about military. This is about what do you want this country to do as a strategy? Those are the things we should be paying attention to. OK, India, Pakistan, I don't have much time to describe that. I've been in India a number of times. I've been in Pakistan once. Uh, however, this, you know, if you want to point at a place that has the greatest likelihood of a nuclear exchange, it's India, Pakistan. Because it's sort of classic. You get a small power, Pakistan, against the big power. And the small power feels it has to develop those nuclear weapons. It's the only way that it's going to survive. And then the United States also plays this incredibly complicated role here as to what is to be done. This is where we should be paying a lot more attention than we are. And then we have Iran. So we sort of moved Iran with this thing called the JCPOA, uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which was the nuclear deal uh, to move Iran away from the place it was, which was more or less it had the option to build a bomb, but didn't build the bomb, to move it away so that it would take more time in the future. Uh, it was one of uh, President Obama's crowning achievements uh, as president. President Trump, this is just reasonably recent, you know, still said it's the worst deal that's ever been made. Now it turns out there are so many complicated things involved in the Iran deal. In my opinion, in terms of the nuclear part of this deal, it was the best that could ever be accomplished. They did walk away from sort of that brink of being there to be able to build a bomb. Now, does that mean that the Iranians are all really good guys? Well, that government is a terrible autocratic government. Its people are not very happy with that. This is the recent street protests uh, in, in Iran. <coughs> However, if indeed we say this is the worst deal ever made and we walk away from that deal against totally against the wishes of all of our partners from the European Union to the Chinese to the, to the Russians. If we walk away, then we put the nuclear mix back into the Middle East. That's not a good idea. So we should be paying more attention to this. And, and then there's just the issue uh, of terrorism. And of course, that's where President uh, Bush put a lot after 9-11, a lot of attention. President Obama uh, put a lot of attention. And I just point out, Nuclear terrorism, there's sort of three faces of it. One is a nuclear detonation, so the mushroom cloud. Uh, fortunately, it's pretty difficult for terrorists to get the, the materials, the bomb fuel for that. But then there are the radiological, so-called dirty bombs. Terrorists can get that basically any time they want to uh, because it's in millions of places you know, around. 
uh, or they could sabotage a nuclear facility. So this is important. It's important to pay attention. We need to keep our focus, uh, and the current administration has sort of walked away from what was done before. The sort of things that need to be done, for example, is to get our population ready, because sort of my worst nightmare in this nuclear arena, as you know, as many of you know, back in the days when um, airline hijacking first became popular, there was one hijacking and everyone said, wow, you know, that's amazing, why did they do that? Then all of a sudden there was just a whole spate uh, of, of hijacking. Then there were things like suicide bombers, and whoever thought that people would blow themselves up? And then all of a sudden there were suicide bombers everywhere. Then there were trucks, right, and vans running into people. And then, again, they just one after another. That's what I worry about here. One of these hasn't happened. It would essentially, it would kill very few people. But it would be a catastrophe from the standpoint of the public reaction to fear, the potential economic damage through aerial denial of the fact they've spread this stuff out. And so we need to be paying attention. How do we prepare for this? Especially, how do we avoid the second one? The first one may not be avoidable. Somebody's going to do it someplace. But we should be prepared to make sure that we know how to immediately take care of that and tell people, hey, this is not the end of the world. So that they're not scared. So that's it. Uh, I've talked longer than I had planned to. So that's the quick uh, walk uh, across the world. So what we do at Stanford, uh, I've worked with a number of colleagues there, particularly with a whole bunch of students. I run this nuclear risk reduction. And actually, I always tell the students, hey, it's not so you can't just reduce the nuclear risks. You also have to work on the flip side to increase the nuclear benefits. You know, for example, this radiological problem, the biggest problem with those are the medical sources of radioisotopes. But you don't want to kill nuclear medicine. And it helps millions of people. So you've got to be able to balance those things. And that's, those are the things we work on. And the, the approach that we take is sort of working scientist to scientist. As John said, I go to all these places, work with their scientists, because they have the same concerns. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you have any questions for uh, Dr. Hecker, uh, there will be various uh, gentlemen walking through here with microphones so that uh, we can make sure that we're, we're hearing the question. Thank you. Jack always has a good question to start with. Thanks, uh, Sig, for your dedication. Uh, given Kim's uh, propensity to showing off what he is capable of doing, do you think it's possible that his next step is to actually do a, an airburst delivered by an ICBM, much like China did, to demonstrate their capability? Yeah, so, so the question is, with Kim Jong-un showing off his capabilities, uh, would he actually do, um, let's say, an atmospheric test, uh, much like um, as what Jack did, said that China did? It, it turns out China's was not an ICBM. Uh, China's was a short-range missile. Uh, and, and it was all on Chinese territory, essentially from one end of China to the other. They exploded in their nuclear test site called Lop Nor. Uh, and I just, uh, since I work a lot with the Chinese to try to understand what the North Koreans did. So I asked the guy who was there, a Chinese, so my counterpart, uh, director of their place some time ago. I said, hey, when you did that, that missile test, you know, what are the things you were concerned about? For example, did Mao Zedong tell you guys that in spite of your reservations of the dangers of doing that, you got to do it anyway? He said, no, he didn't tell us that. He said, but we knew it was a dangerous maneuver. We cleared out all the people in the pathway uh, of this particular missile. Uh, and we were very concerned, but we had to do it because we had to demonstrate to the United States, not only, this was in 1966, First test, uh, the, the first atmospheric test I did was 1964. Uh, and we had to demonstrate to the Americans, we actually have a missile that can deliver these things. 
So we had to do it, even though it was dangerous, and we succeeded. But then he said, we never did it again. We never did it again. It scared even them. So with Kim Jong-un, first of all, he can't do one and stay in Korea. Uh, so it would immediately be considered a threat to someone. And uh, that's a big, big risk. Uh, and in fact, they actually at one point, uh, the uh, foreign minister, uh, Lee Young Sup, uh, said they're going to go ahead and detonate one over the Atlantic, uh, over the Pacific, that they would do it in the Pacific. Uh, so no, I think the answer is they will not do that one. Uh, that's both, that's too big a risk for them. Uh, it clearly uh, would uh, get some major response uh, from the United States and its allies. Uh, and second, I think at this point, it would be just as likely that that missile with the warhead on it would blow up in North Korea as it would blow up over the Pacific. You, you know, so you just, you just don't do that. They threaten it. I, I don't think they're going to do it. Oh, uh, let's see. Arvid, uh, up here, do you have the... Who has the mic? Um, I'm curious. We don't have any idea how many centrifuges North Korea has. I guess. How many? How many centrifuges North Korea has, you know, their concealed facilities. But I'm curious, I've heard you talk about how modern the centrifuge plant was. Do we have any idea how efficient the individual centrifuges are? Uh, so w when I was there, uh, they showed me a facility with 2,000 centrifuges. Uh, since, since that time, they have doubled the size of that roof of that building. And so we assume, in most likelihood, they now have 4,000 in that building. Uh, however, on the basis of what I saw, and uh, one of the ways that I constructed those color things as to what they have, is actually we're so much smarter today than we were as we were progressing. Because, for example, with the centrifuges, what they showed me in 2010, then that said they had to be able to have done this, that, you know, in the previous years. And so the conclusion there was they have another facility someplace else, or two. We don't know how many centrifuges are in there. We don't know. How efficient, in other words, how good are those centrifuges? And it turns out for you centrifuge aficionados, uh, if you use the rotors which spin this uranium hexafluoride gas very fast, out of high strength steel, what we call margin steel, uh, then the efficiency is, is sort of four swoo, which you'll understand, per machine. However, if they are aluminum, high strength aluminum, uh, then it's one, or a little less than one. A and we don't know. However, you know, I had to grab this guy who was showing me around. He did not want to show me this facility. I grabbed him by the shoulder and I, when he said, well, okay, we got to go to lunch. I said, I don't want to go to lunch. You know? <laughs> I want to know. What are the rotors made out of? You, you know, are they margin steel? Then he finally said they're an alloy of iron, which it turned out is margin steel. So we assume it's margin steel. And then I actually, with, with my our colleagues at Stanford, I've done a very sophisticated probabilistic model uh, in terms of how much of these key materials for centrifuges could these guys have brought in clandestinely from other countries. And you know about export-import. Uh, and so we made all of those assumptions probabilistically, put them all together, did a Monte Carlo run, and we came up with the fact that maybe 100 to 175 kilograms worth of highly enriched uranium they could make. But it's an estimate. And we could be off by a factor of four, and we don't know that. Yes, I know you had your hand up uh, back, back, yes, in the back first, and then your next friend. As uh, North Korea works on miniaturization, do you know if they're going to uh, eventually work towards MIRV technology? I'm, I'm sorry, on work on militarization and? MIRV, multiple Oh, the MIRV, oh, MIRV. MIRV. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't catch the MIRV. My, my hearing is electronically assisted, so even with <laughs> microphones I have some difficulties. But yes, I understand. So with, uh, with MIRVs, or, or actually uh, with tactical nukes, for example, uh, they have in their pronouncements said, and of course we know how to do that. 
uh, they have not demonstrated anything that they would actually, so the MIRVing is multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicles. That means you have one missile, big missile, and you actually put several warheads on there and target them independently. The US has done that for many years. Uh, actually, Pakistan recently uh, demonstrated rocket-wise that they're able to do that. So we have no indication that they can do that today. Uh, but, you know, if things go on in another, who knows, you know, five, ten years' time, uh, they will be able to master some of that uh, technology. Uh, some people are concerned, for example, that big missile, or several of the big missiles, uh, they have a big enough payload that it would be possible to put multiple warheads on there if they get the warheads small enough. Th those are not the things I worry about today, but it's, uh, it eventually may be possible. I don't think they are there today. I actually worry much more about the tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, would they actually develop battlefield nuclear weapons uh, and be prepared to use those in case the United States or South Korea come across the demilitarized zone. The problem with those battlefield nuclear weapons is first of all, they're terribly unsafe. They're also unsecure because you wind up, you know, giving that nuclear suitcase doesn't go along, the briefcase doesn't go along with those tactical nuclear weapons. So, so you just, you have enormous, enormous risks. Randy, you were next. Yeah. Yes, I think you uh, made the point that uh, you believe that the uh, Iranian nuclear treaty is a good thing. Uh, the question I have is, do you think it's a verifiable type treaty, or is it being verified successfully? Okay, so, so the, the, the question was about the, the Iran <laughs> nuclear deal. Uh, and, and that is, is it verifiable and is it uh, being verified successfully uh, right now? Uh, so the answer is uh, that the nuclear part, it's a nuclear deal, the nuclear part of that is verifiable and, and the Iranians agreed to much, much more stringent verification measures than anything I ever imagined that they would do. It turns out I actually met with the Iranians on all of these sort of issues before the US got into major uh, discussion with Iran. Uh, and I got a pretty good sense as to what they might be willing to do. And in the end, on a nuclear deal, they did more than anything I thought was possible. And so that, that deal, and it's not an official treaty, it's, it's an agreement. Uh, uh, so uh, that deal has better verification measures than almost anything that was ever put together. The problem, you know, the president still says it's the worst deal ever made. He actually said it's an embarrassment for the United States. The, the problem with the Iran agreement uh, is the U.S. has much more than nuclear concerns about Iran. You know, we are worried about their missiles. We are worried about their support of terrorism. We are worried about what they're doing in Iraq, what they're doing in Syria. We're worried about what they're doing in Yemen, supporting the Houthis. They're supporting the Hezbollahs. So the Iranian administration does a lot of things in the Middle East that are really considered to be harmful to the United States of America. And I think what, I think what our president, but certainly many others who have said the Iran deal was not a good deal, they wanted the United States to be able to take care of all of those things with Iran and essentially have Iran just step back and desist from any of those. Well, the other parties, Russia, China, they don't care if they have missiles. They don't care about Hezbollah. Russia likes that Iran's messing around in Syria or, or in Iraq. So how could you ever get Russia to agree to that? Uh, and even with the European Union, we have sort of different views as to what's most important. So with Iran, if you're going to have any agreement, the only one that was possible is they had to delink the nuclear piece from everything else. And so then the, the issue was, do you do that deal or do you do no deal? Uh, and the Obama administration decided to go after that deal. That even if Iran continues to do all of these other things, uh, is the Middle East and the world is a safer place if they do it without nuclear weapons rather than with nuclear weapons. 
See, I'm sort of being blind to this side over here. Were there hands up over here, Duncan? What kind of help has North Korea been getting? And with sufficient outside help, could they maybe uh, get past the, the need to flight test weapons? I'm sorry, John, can you help me out a bit? Or did, did you hear? Uh, Duncan, let me hear. I didn't quite catch you. Uh, how much outside help is North oh, outside Korea help. Get? Okay. And yeah. with sufficient outside help, yeah. okay. can so, they kind of skip the flight test requirement for yeah. weaponizing a missile? Yeah, so, so on the outside help, uh, you know, that's another whole <laughs> uh, long talk. Uh, actually, that goes back over 50 years' time frame. Uh, and uh, just to give a reasonably quick answer, early on, they had outside help from the Soviet Union for peaceful uses of atomic energy. Soviet Union built the first small reactor for the North Koreans, exactly the same way we built the first reactor for Iran because we were helping Iran. We were educating their nuclear scientists because the Shah was our friend. Uh, the, the Soviet government never directly helped the North Koreans with their nuclear weapons program. Neither did China help them with their nuclear weapons program. Uh, what, the, what the North Koreans managed to do uh, is uh, they were educated first in the Soviet Union, <coughs> They then really did a great job in three of their own universities to educate their own nuclear specialists as such. And then they took them to places like Yongbyon. And then they reverse engineered a whole bunch of facilities in the West, the reactor, reprocessing facility, et cetera. So in the plutonium part, they mostly learned and built it themselves. On the uranium enrichment, it turns out technologically that's more difficult for a country at the stage that they were at industrially. They couldn't do that themselves. So they had help. They first got some help uh, actually by buying some centrifuges as best as we know from the Netherlands where they were producing centrifuges as part of a commercial uh, combine. Uh, and then they got help from Pakistan and particularly from AQ Khan. Uh, and then AQ Khan had set up for Pakistan a clandestine network throughout the entire world and Arvid Lundy knows this well, through leaky export control systems uh, all over the world, and they managed to buy materials and equipment clandestinely from all these places. And then in Pakistan, they actually were able to go uh, and get training in AQ Khan's research laboratory on how to run centrifuges. Uh, so you put all of that together, they got the material, got the help and training, and then they built the centrifuges themselves. So this modern facility that I saw was not just 2,000 centrifuges, but it was you know, flat panel displays, LED, light emitting diodes, and it was modern, more modern than anything I'd seen in North Korea. Uh, so in, in that arena, that's what happened. On the missile part, and, and uh, you know, some of the clandestine stuff is still happening, they still try to buy, but it's getting harder and harder for them to do so. On the missile part, you know, from at least what the real missile experts say, uh, they not only had help from the Soviet Union, without question at the beginning, they bought the Scuds, they bought these Nodongs, which are the medium, uh, and then it actually looks like, on that end, they continue to be able, and have been able to, maybe within the last year or two, to buy rocket engines that were designed in Russia and built either in Russia or in the Ukraine, not from the government, but clandestinely. Uh, and so it looks like on the missile front, one of the reasons for this rapid increase in missile progress is that they continue to be able to have access. Okay, let's see, Carl? Yes, uh, Secretary Moniz had a very significant role uh, in the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, I was still doing congressional briefings then and it was clear that his reputation and his presentations impacted a lot of reluctant congressional supporters. Now, we have Rick Perry, is the Department of Energy still engaged in uh, supporting the Iran nuclear deal in a significant way? So, so the, uh, the, the comment and the question was, Secretary Muniz, former uh, Secretary of Energy, uh, had a big role. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, it was a very big role. And it was a, from Los Alamos' standpoint, it was a beautiful role. 
because if you ever wanted to design a system where the technical people were on par with the political diplomatic people, Ernie Moniz, it's like, it turns out he's a good friend of mine, I saw him a couple of weeks ago in Washington also, uh, he's, he's now, by the way, head of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, the Ted Turner organization. So they were sitting side by side uh, and through all these uh, negotiations. So the scientists in this case played a role where they not just were asked to come in after the diplomats already made an agreement or a treaty, they were there helping to design the treaty, and that's what Ernie Moniz uh, did. And not only that, Ernie was a postdoc at Los Alamos many, many years ago. Uh, he knows the labs, and so he would get the labs together uh, in order to get their latest and best technical advice. And that's why things like the verification measures are the best uh, that was, uh, was possible. So he did a great job. Uh, so currently, uh, I would think that's dropped down in the current administration significantly. There's still very good people in the Department of Energy that answer the questions, but I don't think there's anybody in the Department of Energy leading that effort. Yes, right? Did you have a question? No, all right. Yeah, just go all the way in the back. I saw that hand for... <coughs> I might have to help you help me out, John. Sig, it's been a wonderful presentation. And uh, you've taken us through 25 years of uh, viscosity and non-proliferation, but to the eventual failure of uh, preventing North Korea from, uh, from gaining nuclear weapons. Uh, if, if we look from 1945 to the present, and then we look 25 years into the future, I can think of maybe 25 nations around the world in, in uh, the Far East, in South Asia, in the Middle East, in Eastern Europe, maybe even in South America that are similarly motivated, resourced, and capable. What do you see for proliferation in the future? Yeah, so very, very good question. In other words, the question uh, is what's the future uh, of the non-proliferation regime as such. And it was pointed out as we look, you know, since uh, the end of World War II, uh, actually, you know, if, if you look at this non-proliferation regime, as we would call it, not just a treaty. A treaty was uh, signed in 68, went into effect uh, in uh, 1970. If you look at the regime, all of the things that are done from the IAEA, you know, from security assurances and everything else, I'd have to look back and say, you know, this regime has been pretty successful. You know, because today we have 10 or fewer, uh, and I won't get into counting them all off <laughs> for a variety of reasons. So we have 10 or fewer countries that we think have nuclear weapons. Uh, there, are, there are at least uh, eight of them who have declared uh, so. So uh, that's not a lot. President Kennedy. Uh, in the early 1960s was projecting uh, that by the end of that decade there would be 25 uh, nuclear weapons countries and there are not 25. So the, for me the hope for the future is technologically what we've demonstrated you really can't stop people just by keeping them away from the technology. And North Korea is a classic case, right? Here's a country that most people thought was in the backwaters uh, you know, of technology and industry, and they did it. It turns out actually one of the reasons they're not in the backwaters. They're pretty good. Uh, but we weren't able to stop them. Pakistan is another one. And what those two countries, for example, show that if they feel the need is sufficiently large, that it's great, that the only way they're going to keep their country up and alive, they're going to build nuclear weapons. So instead of going after the capabilities and the technology, what one really has to do is go after the motivation. Actually go after the fact that, hey, the nuclear weapons don't do you any good. You know, Kim Jong-un is going to find out you can't eat nuclear weapons. <laughs> you know, and so at some point, what he's going to have to worry about is his people. If he continues you know, to make economically life so difficult for his people, eventually that's going to turn around on them. And you can't eat nuclear weapons. 
and he doesn't have the access you know, to the international community. And so actually, I mean, that's my hope. And, and Kim jong I mean, again, he, he's only not, he's not crazy, he's not stupid. And he's actually quite smart if you look what he's done. He's actually said he has a two-pronged strategy, military and economic. All of you know about the rise of China, uh, you know, in the, in the last 35 years or so. Well, China didn't go and do the industrial development and open up to the world influence until they had nuclear weapons and felt that they had their security assured. Once they had that, then they went ahead and did market liberalization. And, and so there's some hope that now with Kim Jong-un saying, okay, we're there, you know, they're not gonna attack us anymore, that he opens up from an economic standpoint. And, and quite frankly, my big hope for North Korea uh, is actually China. But it's for a totally different reason than President Trump. President Trump says, you know, China is the answer because if they squeeze them hard enough, the North Koreans are going to give up. Well, I've been in North Korea seven times. I also know a lot of South Koreans. You know, they are the same people. Let me tell you, the Koreans are determined, determined people. They're not going to squeeze those nuclear weapons out of them. But the reason that China is the hope is the North Koreans hate the Chinese. That, and it isn't just, you know, the last 25 years, 50 years, we're talking about thousands of years. Korea, that whole Korean peninsula feels that they've been squeezed between China and Japan. They're the shrimp between two whales. Uh, and with the way that the sanctions and everything has been applied, we've driven North Korea into the arms of China. And they're dependent on China economically. And they don't like it. They do not like it. And so a strategy on the U.S. part is actually to say, hey, why don't you come over here? You know what I mean? We can deal with you guys. But that takes a very different attitude you know, than what we've seen uh, so far. I also, in the charts that I showed you, which I said at this point, they're not yet for publication because we're still working on it. And each one of those little boxes that you saw, uh, right now we have about 70 pages of information that goes into those boxes to be able to say, we didn't just pull this out of thin air. Uh, you know, we actually did a scholarly study to what happened during those years, what did they produce, what was diplomacy like, so we're going to try to do all of that. So, for example, one uh, of uh, a couple of the uh, columns that I have in, um, uh, in, this, in this effort is one shows sanctions as a function of years. The other one shows North Korean economy. And then you have the nuclear stuff. And as the sanctions have increased more and more and more, the North Korean economy has gotten better more and more and more. You know, there are peculiar things that happen. And then, of course, the nuclear went in the other direction. OK, ladies and gentlemen, it's 8.30. I think this is the appropriate time to call it quits again. I thank you for your attention.